Klein is our guest here, county administrator. Good morning, Gary. Good morning. G Dub. Yeah, you stuck me in this chair. I mean, I'm. Are you I okay? Like I'm on top of the world. You get, that's the barber chair. Yeah. Yeah, right. yeah you and Gil scrap the same height. Yeah, this is yeah. captain's chairs. So yeah. You know, it's so look, important. You look down on the other host. <laughs> it's a, it's a, <laughs> literally <laughs> and figuratively uh -huh. looking down. At the yeah. Host. Most of us come in and say the chairs are too high. John comes, and John has the tallest chair in the room. He comes and says the chair is not high enough. Give me another six inches. The alternative is a chair that comes up to your chin, and you feel like you're at the kids' table. So it's, I, I prefer this way. We use that chair now to hang Bill's coat. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, there's been some changes to the Dunn building, and if you haven't been there in a little while, you're in for a pleasant surprise. Well, I can tell you that the, the effort of moving the folks out of the historic courthouse that had been there a couple hundred years. It was interesting, to say the least. But you have a one-stop shop at 400 West Stephen Street, so you can record a deed, pay your taxes, interact with the assessor, building permit, planning effort, fiduciary, uh, fire board, ambulance authority, all in one place. So now in, in the, the, uh, the block there on Stephen Street, you can see us all. And also you're relocated, so the, the ambulance and the, uh, the fire board is side by side instead of having to walk all across the building, same way with the assessor's office and the sheriff's office. So when, when this started, uh, the entire effort was to support the public and make it an easy process. So when you came in, 90% of the services that you're going to walk through the door for are on the first floor. Uh, we kind of put them side by side, so the, the workflow, fire and EMS, the workflow with the assessor and the tax office, they literally are right beside each other. And now, having moved the county clerk out of 100 West King Street, it, it, everyone is in one location. Why did it take so long for this to happen? Gary? My goodness. Seems so to make sense. That, let's go back about 10 years ago, and God rest his soul, Mr. Small, John Small, who was a, the, the county clerk for many, many years, was the beginning of, uh, in the beginning of conversations and I can tell you initially he was reluctant you know he's like that's putting it mildly <laughs> but but he did come around and the conversation started about you know what it would look like moving if you remember we moved his uh, voters registration office back five or six years ago into the Dunn building and that kind of started the conversations with John about what it would look like if he were in the same building with the uh, with everyone uh, fast forward now to 2024 and it's finally happened and it in, in my opinion is is a really good function for the public yeah john small was an institution <laughs> and uh and john uh, uh john had some reluctance to, to to change the individual that i think was most influential on john to get him to buy into change was gary wine and that was on a host of fronts uh if you walked into john's personal office at the old uh, historic courthouse uh, it was the office out of the 50s and 60s there'd be papers piled up chest high and he knew where most everything was and but it was a you walked in and said the most unorganized office imaginable uh, and to his eye to anybody else's eye it probably was but outside of his personal office thanks to Gary Wine John had one of the most modern one of the most uh, uh, responsive, I guess, or looking for another word, of any offices around. It was they, the technology was incorporated. We led the state in so many aspects of technology. Again, within John Small's office, you get away from his personal office, look at the office in total, very, very modern. It it uh, it was a blessing to have been able to work with John and to really offer to him opportunities with technology that he necessarily didn't understand, but he accepted. So because he trusted you, and he had a he had a yeah. great team, yeah. and the county commission really worked hard to fund those efforts because that stuff isn't cheap, right? So yeah, John, I can remember back in 1998. Uh, beginning the digitization process of the records in the courthouse. So he was probably the first clerk in the state to really take hold and start moving forward. Is there another step that needs to happen in this process right now? Well, yeah. I can tell you that the next step will be to identify exactly what Berkeley County needs to do with the historic courthouse and what role it can play in the efforts locally. Uh, it's abandoned 
not abandoned, but it's empty right now. There isn't any workflow in the building. So the county commission has begun to, to really start to think about what they can use that building for. And, Rob, we're blessed and we're cursed at the same time with these beautiful old buildings. We have the old post office as well a, that has uh, been in private hands for several years. Uh, these buildings are too valuable, too precious to tear down, but they're expensive to maintain. Uh, and uh, I think the county's challenged or will be challenged to find a utilization of the historic courthouse uh, to preserve the building and to utilize the building. Uh, it's something that everybody wants to do, but it, it's a it, there's a price tag to go with it, a fairly substantial price tag. What year does that courthouse date back to? I believe... 1870s, 1880s, something. I don't. Was it here with the Civil War? Matt Umstead, if you're listening, text Rob. Or, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or Virginia Sign. If Virginia right. Sign's listening, which she does, so she they would, would know. know as well. Yeah, Matt could ran, ramble yeah. that off in a second. But I'm yeah. telling you, there is absolutely no intention of the County Commission to I, let I it know come that. off books. I, it's, yeah. It will be something uh, to see once it's done and to use. It's just a matter of what. And the program of what that building can be used for, I think, is endless. There's there's opportunities of agencies that exist in the downtown area that, that are sub-agencies of the city and the county that may have a home there. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. When was it there. last renovated? Oh, my goodness. It seems like it's been a steady renovation over the I mean, years. Does it have modern wiring and plumbing? No. No, oh. it does not. It has a, a modern roof, so it's dry inside. It has... Uh, windows that when the wind blows you know you don't have to worry about new air inside they yeah. kind of come through in and out the bit but and no it hasn't been through a great renovation in many many years and also john it depends what what floor you're on the bottom okay. floor the first floor has kept up whereas the upper floor has been more or less abandoned now for or the third floor yeah the more top two yeah. so the we're talking millions floor. of dollars in renovation. It, it, it's a yeah. it's a seven figure number just to do the hvac in it which is probably one of the driving factors right it it, it was struggling and they were faced with uh, well over a million dollars to address that and we started looking at the program chain and said listen we really need to make the move now and just apply the monies where it makes sense and we're not the only county faced with this probably not the only state governor tomlin recognized the preservation of these old courthouses uh in his turn and put some money into it but it was a stopgap measure it was not nearly enough money to uh, to renovate but there's an awareness throughout the state need to preserve these old buildings yeah and, and you know the berkeley county commission took this initiative in the early 2000s this isn't new yeah. i mean this is 25 years in the making to where we are today so you know from the edge of raleigh street where you have the new day report center and its addition then you come over to the sheriff's department the judicial center over to the dunn building there's one historic mill left woolen mill left and that is what we call the crawford building the design plans are already at 93% for it. It will be the expansion of the magistrate offices and their courtrooms. So probably in 2029, that renovation to the tune of $20 million will start, and then the complex will be finished. Yeah. Now, how much hot bunking, that's not the right word, but how much is sharing of judicial office spaces do we have? So th there aren't any sharing. Uh, there's been some repurposing. Matter of fact, as we sit here, we've got a about an $800 renovation to the historic jail on the property. That's going to be uh, the, the new judge's temporary court space to eliminate any kind of sharing going on. Now, I'm not saying they don't share courtrooms, but as far as office space, there's room. Um, once we get the renovation going for uh, the Crawford building, and then there'll be much more room for the magistrates to have their own hearing rooms and things of that nature. Let's go back very quickly to the Dunn building. Not only have you uh, uh, moved in all the offices, county offices, uh, and but you've also refurbished the building. Uh, we were there last week for the candidate forum, be there again tomorrow for the candidate forum, uh, and it was as if you're walking in a brand new building. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, the floors have been redone painting you have a new multi-purpose building it's a it's really a refreshing building to walk into it everyone's proud of it right yes. the spaces i mean you're in a a, a hundred plus year old building and it feels like you're in a brand new office exactly. space when you sit yeah. down so it's difficult 
to, to get not only the floor plan correct, but to kind of have, you, you're still in the building, you still feel like it's old, you can still see the, the two inch floor joists and things that you would have seen. It's not all covered up with drop ceilings, yeah. but at the same time, as you said, it's gonna do paint, it's got new flooring, uh, but I, I really, really Excuse want me, to flooring repair. It's not new flooring. It's, no, it's, it's just re resurfaced. Resurfaced because yes, you sir. still have the wide planks you do. that were uh, original with the building. You do. Yeah. You do. And some of the beams that run down in the yeah. offices that, that are hundreds of years old, It's yeah. you can't buy this stuff anymore. Yeah. Yeah. One of our listeners, Jackie Long, came in. The original courthouse was built in 1855 to 56 at a cost of $18,000. There you go. Well, thanks, Jackie. Very good. I just did the inflation calculator on that, and that would be six hundred and fifty-two thousand dollars today. Hmm. Which seems like it's not enough for that building. <laughs> no. Right. That building seems like it'd be worth a lot more than that. Yeah. The uh, the 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 bank building that sits behind one of the West King, which is one ten, it was appraised, I think, for about one point four. Yeah. Yeah. So they got a good deal on that building in eighteen fifty-five. They I would sure say. did. Right. They sure did. When they made the transition away were there any plans discussed at that point as to the future purpose of the old courthouse building no that it was purposely left alone to get it empty so we could take a holistic no rush look at it and really come up with a good game plan so uh, i'll offer that if anybody has ideas uh, please let us know but the, the initiative to really repurpose it hasn't started yet we're, we're still trying to get the clerk in his new space uh, and i think we'll get that done the next couple of weeks and then we can step back and start to make a game plan. If you can't get some grants to refurbish that building, is it worth the money for the county to actually do it? Uh, let's remember it's it's purpose, right? It's history. It's mm -hmm. it's that isn't something sometimes you really end up spending more money than you would would have liked to, but there will be an effort for grants. Uh Maybe it's one of those situations where you have a public-private partnership and it becomes multi-use. I don't know, but uh, I, there's no decision made, and our, our eyes and ears are wide open. Gary, I'm shifting gears now. Uh, and election season, one of the questions that always come up are the voting machines. I realize you're no longer in charge of the technology aspect, but you work very closely with uh, with voters, and you're involved very much mm -hmm. in machines. Uh, address the reliability and the uh, um, Honesty, that's a probably a better word uh, for the voting machines. So before we go to that, let's mention on the, the office, and you mentioned the multipurpose room, that will be the Dunn Building's early voting location uh, along with the t other two. So in that big multipurpose room, that will be the, the early voting location. So plenty of space, plenty of privacy. That's the second floor now when you walk second in. Second floor. Yeah. Come up to the second floor. And right across from the county commission across that open right space. Right next to the elevator. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. correct. But to the security efforts, Clerk Petrucci, the county commission, have invested heavily in the latest versions of technology that, that are out there. Uh, Could they, I interrupt very quickly? Now, sure. he did not do this in a vacuum. He did this in concert with Sec Secretary of State. Oh, a thousand percent. Okay, yeah. So you, yeah. can't, you can't invest in voting equipment unless it is on a, a supported or authorized technology platform that the Secretary of State has already up authorized. So they every voting location in Berkeley County has brand new equipment and clerk Petrucci most recently invested in a greater quantity of equipment because he, he found out in the last in the last election that they needed more machines for purposes of flow so things could move faster some of those heavy areas so they spent probably the better part of a quarter of a million dollars recently so they'll start delivering equipment uh, Monday what is that the fourth whatever Monday is that will all be delivered and set up so on election day when the poll workers come in, it's ready to rock and roll. Now, these systems are totally sealed, are they not? They are. So there is never a point where the piece of equipment that you cast your vote on touches the outside 100%. They have um, USB encrypted USB devices inside of them. So when you cast your votes at the locations, when they come to the Dunn building for purpose of data extraction, excuse me, to 750 Baltimore Street for purpose of extraction after the voting on that day, on Tuesday, election day, it has never touched the outside world. Uh, and then we physically remove those. They go in a special tabulator or reader on premise that's secured behind closed doors. So I could not imagine a, a more um, secure way to and, and they have no access to internet so nobody Zero. can get into uh, manipulate. Zero. Okay. absolutely positively never touch the internet 
And, you know, the, the, the remote or the, the places where you can vote early at South Berkeley and Beddington, Clerk Petrucci and the county commission take it to another level when it comes to that location security. When, when we put those machines in there, they're guarded 24 seven the entire time that they're away from the Dunn building. So they work really hard to protect everything. Gary, are you aware of the confusion over the Pike side location? No, sir. Yeah. People get the wrong idea about where to vote because I guess it's referred to as Inwood. I have no idea. Yeah. Well, no, we talked to Tony Petrucci about that. I know I get uh, one of the poll workers usually sends me information on that. And I know there were people who went to the wrong location last time. Uh, but I won't go down that road with you because that's not your yeah that's not that's not your uh, your world. The financial health of the county, however, is your world. And I know that a couple of years ago there was uh, some concern at one point along the way in midstream because of some some money with the county uh, salaries that were being paid and whether you had enough money to cover all that. Uh, at least that was what was being sent to me. What is the financial health of Berkeley County this time around? Yeah, great shape. Uh, the commissions worked hard to be diligent with the tax dollars. As you all know, the levy rate has stayed the same. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the county commission hasn't said to the public, hey, we need to take more money from you. They've lived within their means. Uh, we just most recently invested a million dollars in the rainy day fund. So they're doing a great job and they're in good shape. What's the rainy day balance in the county? 8.4 million. And Bill, at one point when you had taken over during the tough economic times, it was $4? <laughs> I was think I was trying to think. It was a little bit more than four dollars, Rob, but not much more than four dollars. Um, it was I, a very small amount. Yeah, right? it was a very very small amount. I I think it's a couple of thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. That was it, and uh, just barely enough. And uh, I give Ron Collins credit. We did not have the rainy day fund to uh, fall back on. So for one of the few times in uh, uh, in the county's history, we scaled back with our expenditure every. Every agency in the county had to scale back, I think, somewhere between 7 to 10 percent. This was around 2007, 8, 9? 2007, mm -hmm. 8, and 9, yeah. Right that's around exactly that. exactly right, yeah. Right. Yeah. No rainy day fund, so the credit goes to the county commissioners, the county sure council, to, to boost it up over time. And they've continued to live within their means and try not to have to reach out to the public and have to increase the levy rate. They worked really hard that way. Do you have to go into that fund to cover day-to-day -day operating costs at times whenever cash flows off a bit? No, sir. We haven't touched that fund in years. Yeah. And the, uh, the fund's primary purpose, obviously, as a rainy day fund, is to provide emergency financial backup. But ultimately, it assures you get a good bond rating, correct? That is absolutely the truth. So one of the things they have to do, and as you, you have heard, they're investing in the Inwood Park. So we'll be going through a bond rating here soon because they're going to borrow $3 million to get the park started to match some federal funds they have there. So um, all of those efforts are taken seriously, and they have not had to touch it and uh, knock on wood that we don't have to any time in the near future. Gary, in, years, in the months past, you've been talking about the Internet and broadband being uh, uh, available throughout the county. Where are we at that, at that program? So the Berkeley County Commission partnered with Frontier Communications about a year and a half ago for the expansion of broadband on the west side of North Mountain. They got a $16 million grant. Uh, the county commission committed a million. Frontier fronted, I think, $8 million in the state grant funded the other most recently the new rounds of bead grants are going on at the state level so they're vying for effort to kind of really encompass and do everything east of the mountain so i would venture to say in the next 36 to 48 months berkeley county be saturated with broadband and they call it fiber to the home uh everywhere you go even we john have, gale scrapper yeah john, that, was, even you that, and was, I. that was my question coming up there That's even right. you and i all right <laughs> well so you do not have it I do not. I thought I have, West you would. West we, well, I'm yeah. in the West area. Yeah. Uh, make sure that I'm the last one installed. <laughs> but okay, yeah. um, no, it, I'm, I'm one of the addresses that will be included in the expansion yeah. project to the West. Yeah. Yeah. I live off of Mountain Lake Road, yeah. which has broadband, and but you turn down my little road and it gets slow really fast. Yeah. So what do you do? Don't use the internet. I farm. <laughs> <laughs> Starlink works pretty well. It, sh yeah. it shouldn't be a choice of one or the other, though. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, my kids have moved out, and it's my wife and I at home, so we we don't need the internet. We'll just relax. That's cool, right? Um, what's on there after they leave and work anyway? Yeah, who right? needs it? Yeah, Gary Wine is our guest. He's the county administrator. Did you have another question, Mr. Gilstrap? No, that was where I was. That's where you wanted to go. It's, 
saw it coming, Bill. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, parks wise, you, you, you touched on it a little bit ago. What are what are the next projects in terms of the county and parks? So the big commitment, um, while I don't know all of the comp plan and what the Parks and Recreation or the County Commission with regard to Inwood Park, they secured a two point two million dollar grant. Uh, they've uh, committed to borrowing $3 million to get the Inlet Park off the ground. So that process has started all of the, the, the Region 9 uh, with CEC and the County Commission are working through right now, dotting all the I's and crossing all the T's uh, to begin to get the construction plan done. I would hope that that can hit the streets probably early winter maybe even february january get the bids back with potential groundbreaking and construction started next summer when you plan for a park do you also have to plan for additional employees to man the park and additional equipment to maintain the park what for sure on the maintain and that's the relationship as you well know with the parks and recreation system in in berkeley county uh we they've had that discussion early on and understand that once this is up and running there'll be need for future fund or more funding to help them maintain the thing do uh users fees ultimately uh, result in what uh, generates the most funds for maintaining parks or staffing them with people? Well, in Berkeley County, they do. Uh, we're going through the process now in, in assessing potential opportunities for impact fees. And we just met last Thursday when Parks and Rec were at the table and it listened to Joe Burton discuss about exactly how how, mu how much revenue they generate from themselves and how they help themselves stand up. So unlike other park systems where they're 100% um, supported by funds from cities and county. Do you know the percentage of user fees that make up the Parks and Rec I do, fund? He, I should. I heard him say it. It was high. Uh, it, it was over 50%, I believe. They mm -hmm. do a great job. Yeah, we'll get Joe back on the program. He'll have more details on that. Yeah, I am, I'm dated on this. I uh, talking to Steve Catlett several years or so ago, but I was thinking that the, uh, the county and the state, the county, only 7 to 8%. Everything else came from it's other small. forces. So over 90% yeah. yeah. user yeah. base? Berkeley yeah. County Parks and Recreation, and again, Steve Catlett for 40 years, yeah. and Joe Burton doing a great job now. They worked really hard to support yeah. themselves. Yeah. One minute left. Gary, final word is yours. I, I, I think it's important for everybody. Please come see the Dunn Building and the renovations. It's a one-stop shop for county government here in Berkeley County. Uh, all of it done living within our means and with the greater good and supporting the taxpayer is, was the vision from the beginning. Very nice. Good stuff. Appreciate the visit. You're welcome. Thank you. Good to see you guys. You too. Gary Wine, County Administrator. And uh, we uh, take our halfway through the 9 o'clock hour break.